From Diego Maradona's Hand of God goal in the 1986 World Cup, to the shot pulled off by Michael Jordan in the 1989 NBA playoffs, there are sports moves that fans only associate with the names of great athletes. And when it comes to tennis, no name is more synonymous with peak-level performance than Roger Federer. The tennis legend, whose 24-year career just recently came to a close having won an incredible 15 titles after the age of 35, had a longevity resulting from a relentless player's drive to continually improve aspects of his game so late into his career. This was perhaps no better seen than in the late summer of 2015, when the 34-year-old Federer added a new returning move to his vast skill set, a throwback of sorts to more aggressive classical tennis, rushing the net to return his opponent's serve as early as possible, going on the offensive, and putting his opponent on their back foot right from the start. Serving both as a bold point-finishing move and a means to disrupt his opponent's game plan, he dubbed this new tactic the Sneak Attack by Roger, or Saber. Initially hated by many, with multiples more left bewildered, the rarely before-seen blitz marked the culmination of Federer's years of experience and experimentation in crafting a move which may have contributed to one of the best late-career athletic comebacks of all time. But while extremely flashy and undoubtedly impressive when executed, do the statistics actually validate Sabre's usefulness in a professional-level match? How effective really was it? This is one of the many questions answered in the story behind Federer's signature move that stirred controversy, raised accusations of theft, and took the tennis world by complete surprise. With his pinpoint spot serving and impeccable shot making skills, Roger Federer's aggressive brand of tennis allowed him to dominate the sport at the dawn of the new century, when tactics were gradually shifting away from the quick two point shots of the past toward increasingly protracted rallies and baseline play. As reference, from 2003 to 2007, the years Federer won his five consecutive Wimbledon titles, the use of the serve and volley as the go to tactic on the first serve decreased from 29% to 15%, and continued to drop in popularity at the tournament over the following decade. The eventual slowing of court speeds and the evolution of racket technology favored more defensive, powerful baseline players. It's no coincidence then that Federer's two most successful rivals and greatest challengers over the years, Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic, would come to be known for their skills in stonewall defense and remaining firmly on the baseline. As Federer consistently struggled to win hardcourt battles against Djokovic and Nadal from 2008 onward, it seemed that his former dominance of the game was all but over. That is, until August of 2015, when Federer proved that an old player could still learn new tricks. Arriving at the 2015 Western and Southern Open in Cincinnati, and coming off a second consecutive Wimbledon final defeat against Djokovic a month prior, a jet-lagged Federer found himself in a practice session with French player Benoit Paire. In it, Federer's coach, Severin Luthi, kept advising him to take the return earlier, advice the Swiss star proceeded to take only for Luti to tell him again to take the return even earlier. Roger asked his coach, how early do you want me to take it? With Luti responding, even earlier. Eventually, Federer decided to return pair serve practically on top of the service line with a backhand half volley to set up a volley winner and end the point as quickly as possible. Witnessing its effectiveness at aggressively winning points, Luti suggested that Federer should use this move in the actual tournament. And Federer did just that. What started as the Swiss maestro's cheeky joke during practice ended up being a brutal tactic when used in an actual match. Throughout the tournament, Federer leveraged the saber to win pivotal break points and tiebreak points, taking the likes of the big serving South African player Kevin Anderson, frequent hardcore rival Andy Murray, and world number one Novak Djokovic completely off guard, as none of them could respond to this bold new addition to Federer's game. With the Sabre in his toolkit, Federer would end up sweeping Cincinnati without dropping a set, winning his seventh title at the tournament. The Sabre was born. But what made this move so special compared to other high-risk tennis moves? While not as rare as seeing a top-level player pull off an underarm serve to gain a quick advantage, or hit a backwards tweener on the run, the Sabre possessed unique advantages beyond just the element of surprise. Firstly, it was an incredibly aggressive tactic that allowed the returner to end points quicker, suiting an older player like Federer who wouldn't have to expend as much energy in protracted matches against younger opponents in their physical primes. But the Sabre also served as good psychological warfare, implanting doubts in his opponent's mind about when Federer might unleash the move, which could affect their following serves. The dynamic, improvisational gameplay the Sabre inspired relates to the move's third big advantage, as a throwback to the tactics of old-school attacking tennis. In the past, when the sport was played on faster and slicker courts, 
the chip and charge, the action of slicing a return from the back of the court to throw an opponent off guard and go on the offensive immediately, developed as a tried and tested move. For the Sabre, instead of chipping the ball from the back of the court, Federer charged to the front of the court from the start of the point. In an age of powerful serves averaging speeds of 120 miles per hour, it would take a player with remarkable timing and precision to successfully execute a return so close to the net, but timing and precision have never been things Federer has lacked. In his post-match interview after winning the Cincinnati final, comparisons were even drawn between the Sabre and returning to an old-school version of tennis centered on quick points and attacking the net. But not every old-school player in the tennis world welcomed the move. The legendary former tennis player Boris Becker, who was coaching Djokovic at the time, called the tactic disrespectful, and later said that if Federer had tried the Sabre on any of the older generation of male players in their time, including himself, they would just go straight at him. While not hitting the ball at Federer, opponents found it easier to hit around him whenever a Sabre was deployed. And while initially a surprise to the competition, Federer's new weapon wasn't without its weaknesses. For instance, while Djokovic struggled against the Sabre in Cincinnati, he adapted his game to counter the move during the rematch at the US Open final a month later, deploying lobs to exploit Federer's vulnerability whenever he approached the net early. Even in the matches he won where he used the Sabre, the move was only effective at winning points one-third of the time. In his earlier US Open semifinal against fellow Swiss star Stan Wawrinka, Federer used the Sabre three times, with only one of those winning him the point. An identical stat occurred in his final match against Nadal in the Swiss indoors tournament in Basel later that year. The Sabre alone wasn't enough to guarantee Federer's success. Although he ended 2015 with six tournament titles and an 85% win percentage, and his first win against Nadal in three years, 2016 marked a significant drop-off in his game. He won no new titles, instead dropping to a 75% win-loss record, and a semi-final loss at Wimbledon that resulted in him withdrawing from the rest of the year to address a long-standing knee surgery. So was the Sabre just a flashy move with a little substance? Although his new tactic may have been short-lived, adopting the move forced Federer to propel improvements in his game, which after six months of recovery from his injury, set the stage for him to pull off his greatest sneak attack on the tennis world at the start of 2017. Throughout Federer's lengthy and successful career, prevailing sentiment had long concluded the one aspect of his game which had consistently held him back, his backhand drive. When properly working, the one-hander is undeniably one of the most elegant and functionally impressive shots in professional tennis. But as we've mentioned in previous videos, it's also his weakest shot, an aspect his greatest rivals have taken advantage of throughout his entire career. For years, Federer resorted to the backhand slice as a defensive maneuver during tight matches. But as ATP analyst Craig O'Shaughnessy claimed to observe in the three years from Sabre inception into early 2017, repeatedly performing the backhand half volley required for the Sabre forced Federer to shorten his backswing, allowing him to take the ball earlier to create cleaner drive shots, eventually transforming his backhand from an exploitable weakness into a devastating weapon. No better seen than at the 2017 Australian Open. Federer came to the tournament seated 17th in the draw after six months off from injury, with little public expectation that he would advance very far. However, equipped with a newly improved backhand that complemented his revamped racket design, the Swiss took the competition by storm. Across his seven matches, he hit a stunning 80% of his returns on the backhand side, amounting to 76 winners across the tournament while also throwing in a Sabre for good measure here and there. In his five-set final against Nadal, he hit 14 backhand winners, eight of them in the final deciding set, which allowed Federer to clinch the match and the title, ending his five-year Grand Slam dry spell. With his momentum and more complete attacking game, the 35-year-old Federer was virtually unstoppable for the rest of the year, with the Sabre making several more appearances in his matches as he racked up titles at an astounding rate. But it was also this year that one consistently controversial player raised the question, did Federer even invent the Sabre at all? In early 2017, the ever-controversial Australian player Nick Kyrgios called the Sabre the stolen attack by Roger, claiming that he himself used the move first while playing against the Swiss legend during a practice session in Zurich in 2014. While the accuracy of his claim remains questionable, Kyrgios began to use the Sabre himself to great effect throughout 2017. With the move complementing his already aggressive playing style and point finishing skills, he successfully deployed the tactic against top players, and even tried the tactic against Federer himself in their epic three-set clash at the Miami Open. But in the battle between the Sabre's namesake and the young upstart who claimed it was his, the older player prevailed. 
Federer went on to establish one of the most dominant seasons of his late career. While using the Sabre alone was not a potent enough weapon for Federer, his adoption of the tactic led him to craft a more complete and intimidating attacking game, re-elevating him to the top of the tennis world at an age when most players would be considering retirement. In doing so, he demonstrated a quality that all great champions possess, the willingness to continuously find ways to improve one's game, no matter their age or years of experience. Federer's sole invention of the Sabre may continue to be questioned, and future players may decide to take up this aggressive tactic, but for the rest of tennis history, it's likely that the sneak attack will be associated with one name only, Roger. Now, this video tackled just one of the many, many ridiculous shots that Roger practiced and successfully pulled off over his 20 plus year career. But while making today's episode, I couldn't help but remember one particularly unusual shot of his that once had the world in utter disbelief. Remember this? In the era before trick shots were an internet mainstay, Federer seemingly pulled off a stunt impressive even by today's standards, with the resultant low-resolution video going extremely viral across the web with camps firmly divided over the video's authenticity. Real or fake? Upon looking into this myself, I inadvertently discovered the truly fascinating and little-known story behind the viral video, involving disgraced public sporting figures, a brand in crisis, and of course, the actual truth regarding the shot heard around the world. To satisfy my curiosity, I decided to make an entire bonus video about this story to serve as this month's episode of Second Serve, my ongoing companion series available right now exclusively on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service co-owned by myself and many other amazing YouTubers you've heard of that allows me to create exclusive bonus videos on more obscure yet extremely interesting tennis topics not quite fit for the YouTube algorithm. All ad-free and censorship-free. In addition, of course, you'll get access to high-quality creator-led classes, loads of early access videos, and full-length original series from other creators you've heard of also exclusive to Nebula. As a creator-owned, subscription-based platform, Nebula allows creators like myself to continue producing the high-quality YouTube content you've come to expect, in addition to exclusive videos not found anywhere else. By signing up using my special link on screen right now, you will get 40% off a regularly priced subscription, giving you access to Nebula for only $2.50 a month. By doing so, you'll directly support myself and all future cult tennis content.